What's up everybody, Tim Anderson here, aka Renfell, back for another episode of Discovering Starfinder, and even though I've technically finished up with my initial read-through of the core rulebook, there's more stuff that I want to dive into and talk about and ask questions about, and today we're going back into the Starships section for the video of the day, but we're not actually covering everything about Starships today. Really what I'm interested in is in today's video is the section on space travel because there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff here and i don't know enough about it and i'm gonna have to read through it and i've got questions um i don't actually know that the first campaign i'm going to dungeon master or game master it's just it's not to say that word um i think the first campaign i'm going to run we're actually i think we're going to start with session like the first adventure path which i don't think has any space combat in it but this was the first part of the book where i was reading through it and i was like you know what um, I kind of want to talk about this one in a video as opposed to just reading it in, you know, blank space with just me, myself, and I. So here we are. If you've never tuned in one of these things before, this is part of an ongoing series as I educate myself on all things Starfinder. Uh, like, subscribe, hit the bell icon. It's a great way to stick around and find out all the other things that you hear in the channel as well as more videos in this series. And of course, don't forget to support in all the ways you can. We'll talk more about that at the end. It's really easy. Just do like super chats and super thanks and memberships. All right, let's get in here and look at this first section. It says that no one knows which packed world first achieved spaceflight, but by the beginning of the modern era, nearly every world had some form of interplanetary travel, either through magical means or through artifacts. So it talks about here, it says... As technology improved, travel time between worlds dropped from months and years to days. But it said that even in the new age of spaceflight, voyages beyond the solar system remained rare um, because traveling to even the nearest star at conventional speeds could take generations. By the way, I read, a, a, or excuse me, I watched a brilliant TikTok video the other day on generational ships and sort of the fallacy of those and how the 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 person who was making the video was talking about how he didn't think generational ships could actually be a thing and he talked about the the social dynamics of why and being like say five generations into a 10 generation trip um and like you've never known anything but this and you've suddenly you're being told your whole life is expected to be about raising a generation who's not going to see a planet and they have to raise a generation that's going to see a planet. And they have to raise a generation who's not going to see a planet. And the generations who came before you didn't see a planet. And it's like, is it real? Is it a myth? Like, all these interesting things. Anyway, uh, that was a side note. I'm getting sidetracked here talking about generational ships. Uh, but it says here, um, da -da 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 -dum, it said, while a few starships had drives capable of circumventing the obstacle of time, they all relied on extremely expensive magical technology, usually controlled by churches or other large organizations. Um, other drives have been theorized, but the packed world has never managed to build them. It says, three years before the end of the gap, the signal went out. Some worlds... Okay, so that actually confuses me because technically the gap is a time during which no one has any recollection, right? So how is it that they know that it was three years before the gap that this went out? At the oh, sorry, I misread that. Never mind, guys. You could pro I probably should edit that out. I'm not going to, so you guys can see my mistake. I misread it. It says three years after the end of the gap. That's, never mind. That dead space has already happened. Um, a signal went out. Um, and immediately following the signal, the new god Triune revealed itself to the pack worlds, claiming to have granted the knowledge as a blessing for its new mortal children. It says these were former, th formerly three minor gods, machines, and robotics, who now networked together into a single entity, um, and they claimed to have peered through the substrata of reality and discovered a previously unknown plane of existence called the Drift, which you could only use via technology, not via magic it's very interesting um it says here um that drift engines operate like earlier interstellar drives by jumping to another plane of existence and then back to a different point of the material plane thus they never actually run up against the hard limit presented by the speed of light huh in the past that had meant using powerful magic and traveling to places like heaven hell the maelstrom of the forest worlds places inhabited by creatures and gods with sometimes inconvenient attitudes and appetites but it says here the drift on the other hand is a different type of dimension a void of swirling color without substance mostly empty 
um, though there is some thought that there might be a quantum foam underlying all creation. It says magic still functions in the drift, but only technology can pierce the membrane between it and the rest of reality. It says here that the triune acts as a gatekeeper to the entire drift, which keeps any other deities or organizations from monopolizing the, the place. Can someone explain to me what they mean by that? What do they mean by the triune acts as a gatekeeper? Because it says here that a signal went out three years after the end of the gap, and it went to everyone. It says some scholars argue that every mortal culture received this information, although some re recipients may never have been aware of it or able to capitalize on it. And in some cases, cultures weren't technologically advanced. So if Triune sent that signal out, what does it mean here that they're the gatekeeper for the drift? Don't quite understand the wording on that. It says most skeptics and members of other religions are forced to admit that Triune has appeared to make good on its egalitarian offer to maintain cheap and easy interstellar travel for everyone, although the use of the drift comes with a catch. It says each time a drift engine is used, a tiny portion of a random plane is torn from its home and added to the drift, set to float there for all eternity. Why? The farther the jump, the larger the chunk of material, which sometimes appears in the jumping ship, adding an element of risk. You never know when a long jump might tear away a chunk of hell and leave you flying through a cloud of furious devils. Okay. Why the technology has this side effect is unknown. Some conspiracy theorists believe that the ever-increasing size of the drift and the ever corresponding shrinking of other planes of existence part of the inscrutable power play by Tryon. That would be my question, because if they're literally destroying the material plane, or the material planes, I should say, if random pieces of that are being torn free every time, every time someone uses the drift, that sounds to me like Tryon is, whether they're, you know, who knows whether it's a nefarious plan or not, but it's, Destroying the material plane slowly, but surely, yeah? Huh. All right, navigation and astrogation. Starships are propelled through space by thrusters. Some are technological, others are magic and machine. It says here... Uh-huh, travel times, those are in the tables. So star thrust, start thrusters. It says a ship's thrusters need a short amount of time to warm up before they are ready to be used. So you can't just jump in your ship and go. It's like a diesel engine in a car. Um, it says most hangars and space docks require the starship's thrusters be deactivated after it lands or docks. However, a starship in orbit always has its thrusters active. A starship also needs to deactivate its thrusters to use drift engines, but it requires no time to do so. Okay. It says travel point to point in a planet. It says 1d4 hours. Larger and, it says larger and smaller starships can operate in a planet or planetoid's atmosphere and can travel between two areas within reason. Depends on the distance between two points. This amount of time can be used to represent travel between two vessels. Okay. Go into orbit or land it takes 1d2 hours. Uh huh. Okay, so it takes one to two hours to get up into space or to land. It says to reach satellite, it takes one to eight hours. For planetary orbit, it takes slightly longer for a starship to reach one of that planet's satellite bodies, or vice versa, than it would take to land. This travel time depends partly on the size of the planet and the satellite's orbit. Travel in system is one D6 plus two days. This is between two planets. And then the travel between systems via conventional thrusters might take decades. So only call any ships or vessels with crews and suspended animation to, to journey. Okay, here we get into drift navigation. So this is what I wanted to know more about. Within a given solar system, jumps are relatively quick and easy. Outside of a given system, however, drift tech divides the galaxy into two sectors, near space and the vast. Near space worlds tend to be closer to the galactic center and the packed worlds, and the systems of the vast are further out. With the only true difference between the regions, the density of drift beacons... What are drift beacons? It says they are mysterious objects, sometimes spontaneous. Drift beacons are mysterious objects, sometimes spontaneously generated and sometimes placed by priests of Triune to help navigation systems orient ships in the drift. How are they spontaneously generated? Huh. It says while placing a single drift beacon on a world isn't enough to convert a vast world to a near space status. 
Placing many in that general region of space can cause the shift. Huh. When traveling to a world through the drift, determine whether the destination is in the same system near space or vast. The distance between the start and the end doesn't matter, nor which category of space you're starting from. Traveling from the vast to a near space world is no more difficult than between two near space worlds. You simply roll to use the travel times below, then divide the results by your star ship drift engine rating to determine how long it takes you for distance. Okay. So it says, for example, a starship with a drift engine rating of two traveling to a world in the vast would roll 5d6 and divide the results by two. If you rolled a 15, then the trip would take seven and a half days. You never round down with drift travel rules since those partial delays can be extremely important when multiple spacecraft are racing each other to a destination. Oh, that's interesting. Additionally, since the drift is a plane that you're traveling through, it's possible to pause mid-jump and even to land on one of the floating chunks of terrain. Oh, you can also engage in starship combat in the drift. Time spent stopped in this manner does not bring you closer to your destination. <laughs> it says the one exception to the rules above is Absalon Station, because for some reason unknown to anyone, the Star Stone at its core acts as an extremely powerful drift beacon, allowing ships from anywhere in the galaxy to jump there in 1d6 days. All right, so here we've got some time for navigation within the drift. Traveling in system is 1d6 days. Travel to Absalom Station is 1d6 days. Traveling to near space is 3d6. Traveling to the vast is 5d6. Traveling beyond the rim. While other galaxies are known to exist, the distance between them and the galaxy of the pack worlds is so incredibly large that there have yet to be any confirmed instances of intergalactic travel using drift technology. Whether this is due to the extreme travel times, limits to the reach of the drift itself, or dangers encountered in the drift during such attempts remains unknown. Okay, so this is this is what I really want to nail down is I want to understand how the travel works within the drift. So it sounds here like they've given us not just within the drift, but just you know star travel overall. Because like when I'm traveling overland, I've all you know having played fantasy games, I always just will you know unless there's a table to tell me, I'll just estimate a distance and be like you know in my head I might just say. I want it to take four days for the players to get there. So I'll roll for each day and see if anything happens along the way. You know, one roll and roll for each day, one roll for each night and see if uh, random encounters. But being able to just roll for travel time, pretty groovy for the space flight thing. Um, but I also like how they talk about how the end system and, and on, you know, if they're on the same planet, you can just roll and you're there within a few hours getting to the other side of the planet, which is really cool. And maybe that's up to the DM to some degree, being like, oh, you're only wanting to go over here, that's an hour. You want to go to the other side of the planet, that's four. I mean, I don't know, are you actually rolling for that every single time you do that? I'd love to hear from other GMs out there how you guys do it. Um, do you stick to that 3D6 rule when it says 3D6, or do you estimate on your own and say, well, that's three, or if you're not quite sure, that's when you roll the 3D6. I don't know. Do they give planetary dimensions, or is that something that's up to you when you're when you're on a planet? Um, another question I have because I haven't sunk my teeth into that portion of the core rulebook or found anything that speaks to that yet. In any case, thanks to those of you who have been following along with this Discovering Starfinder series here on my YouTube channel. It is continuing onwards. Uh, we're continuing to have talks. I think sometime in March we're going to start to get together and have some impromptu meetups on Discord with some of the people who are interested in doing a Starfinder campaign. I believe we're just going to do the starter campaign. Nothing's locked in yet. Uh, we may do an open call here to find another person or two who wants to join. But in the meantime, we've got a few people through Discord who are already ready to go. So by the way, that's the best place to stay in touch with me on a daily basis to get into the Discord. But you know, if you liked what you saw here today, like, subscribe, hit the bell icon, support if you can. Memberships are great. It's month to month. They start at $2 a month and they go up depending on what level you want to contribute to help keep Chris and I fed, our cats fed, the lights on, the internet on, and keep me doing this full time. Beyond that, you can do super chats and stickers on the premieres, super thanks on the uploads, pick up a copy of our tabletop game and map packs and all the other fun stuff over at our Patreon page. You can also get access to the book chapters, get a demo of our point and click game. All those fun ways to support. Thanks to those of you who do. And I'll see everybody next time in the next episode of Discovering Starfinder. We'll do a few more episodes. i got a few more things I have questions about in the core rulebook. And then we're going to be moving on to the Pact Worlds uh, book that I got the other day from Paizo as we continue to work towards our first campaign. Anyway, yeah, I'll keep rambling. 
see you guys next time.